So I've been playing a fair bit of Assassin's Creed lately and recently finished up Freedom Cry, and I enjoyed it. Adewale and the world he inhabits are, for a video game anyway, actually fairly nuanced and fleshed out. The story toys with talking about whether an armed slave revolt is a good idea, whether violent rebellion is going to result in a push for true freedom or will just make things that much worse for those who are still enslaved. And it never really, really goes there, but at the very least some characters advocate fighting and some insist that a more fundamental change is required. Revenge is called comfort. Once the fire is gone, another tyrant will take his place. His death must give this generation of warriors hope. They must not abandon the goal of independence. And the death of these souls? So, barely new life. And that's really cool, because the economics of the slave trade is definitely a system that games can look at, and arguably a lot of the social reasons for racism can be systemized in different ways, from political and legal environments to popular opinion. Games would actually be a fantastic medium for analyzing some of these problems and how to approach them. Except that while both racism and the economics of the slave trade are systems games could look at, here they're sort of brushed aside in the name of rah-rah action. Which, I guess, shouldn't be surprising. I mean, it is an Assassin's Creed game. But that doesn't mean that the game entirely ignores the idea of abolitionism and its mechanics. Adewale is tasked with killing slave owners to free slaves, which, as you free more and more of them, unlock additional missions or bonuses. You are mighty. I thank you. You've endured enough. Which, I mean, okay, it's like a child's idea of how freeing slaves works, but that's not really what I want to talk about. My problem with these mechanics is, is this. The way the game goes about treating slaves as a game mechanic is so disenfranchising and dehumanizing to the slaves themselves that any point it wanted to make about slavery is rendered flaccid. Movies and books about slavery go out of their way to show the true human cost, what it really meant to be a person treated as property in the system of chattel slavery. Or they go into the systems behind slavery, the politics and economics of how it was supported for centuries. But here, slaves are framed mechanically as a collectible that blocks progress. They're effectively points towards an experience bar you want to fill up to either unlock the next mission or get a reward of some kind. Worse, there are two classes of slaves you can rescue. Since you're supporting the militant rebellion, the quote-unquote warriors among the slaves you go and save go on to aid the revolt. What do you need? Recruits. Liberated slaves. The warriors among them join me. The others grow the community for which we fight. These are a smaller percentage of the slaves you save, and they tend to give better rewards as you save them. But they also tend to die first, so they're harder to save. So, just so we're clear, in a game that denounces the chattel slave trade of the 1700s, Ubisoft are treating able-bodied black men as a premium currency worth collecting for personal gain. I'll just let the irony of that sink in. My point isn't that the game is bad or racist or anything. Like I said, I enjoyed it. My point is that these mechanics are a lazy way of framing slavery as something undesirable and freedom as something worthwhile. You want to free slaves because if you free enough slaves, you get neat goodies and unblock progress. I've said it before, win states contextualize play. And by making the act of freeing slaves a win state, Ubisoft has painted slavery as something bad and freed slaves as something good. But considering the complexity and cultural significance of slavery, that's a little trite, don't you think? Free 300 slaves and win the game! Yay, you won! Slavery's over! It's mechanically lazy. It's, it's a ludic shorthand. The game elects not to use its mechanics to dissect the how and why of slavery in order to serve up that Django Unchained-style fantasy of the slave who stood up and gunned down all those stupid racist jerks. And as a result, any emotional impact or commitment to opposing slavery itself is completely undercut. These slaves aren't treated as characters, we don't get to know them mechanically or through the narrative. They're icons, pawn pieces. They mean about as much to the player as the question mark block does in Mario. If you can get to it, hey cool, it gives you some stuff. If not, you know, whatever. The freed slave counter mechanic's simplicity and lack of human empathy results in the player feeling distant and indifferent to the very issue the game is most concerned with.
And what I find interesting about the game's inability to frame slavery in a substantially engaging way is that there's another mechanic set here that, especially in light of Black Flag and Liberation, I do find engaging. Walking around as Atawale in Port-au-Prince or any of the other cities in Freedom Cry means you always have to be a bit on your toes. There are slave catchers in every city, and Atawale bears a slaver's mark. So you always have to be looking a bit over your shoulder in order to make sure that even when you're doing nothing wrong, you aren't attracting unwanted attention. It's a constant reminder of Atawale's position in this society, of a past he can't fully run away from. No matter how much he tries to put it behind him, it's always there. A constant reminder that even as a badass assassin and captain of a ship fighting for the future of the world, in 1700s Haiti, he's considered a second-class citizen who needs to keep his head down. But where Atawale is violently oppressed within his society, Liberation's Aveline feels a softer form of social confinement. Being both biracial and a woman, she has certain social pressures put on her to conform to other people's beliefs about who and what she is. In order to both conform to and subvert the expectations society has placed on her, Aveline can change between three outfits. An assassin's outfit, a slave outfit, and a fancy lady outfit. And... Yeah, they each have different pros and cons for movement and combat, whatever, game stuff. But what's interesting is that they also change how people react to you. For example, there are groups of lecherous thugs throughout the city. As the assassin, they more or less ignore you. As the slave, they may make a lot of lewd gestures, but they otherwise leave you alone. But dressed as the lady, you're suddenly a target for harassment. Oh, what a pretty dress you've got there. Similarly, as a slave, Aveline can blend in with workers or a crowd, but as a lady, she can't. As a lady, Aveline stands out. She's vibrant, she's beautiful, she's striking. But as a slave, she's seen by others as just another face in the crowd. And all that's changed is her clothing. How Aveline presents herself to the world really changes who and what people think she is, and she's under constant pressure to conform to those expectations in different contexts. Now compare both of those experiences moving around the city to Edward Kenway's. Kenway has the ability to move freely in the city. If the authorities are after him, it's because he's legitimately done something wrong, like killing or stealing or being in a restricted area. Beyond that, the world is his oyster. He's free to sit at a pub or pet a dog or meet a contact without worrying if there's a slaver behind him or if he's dressed the right way to interact with the people he's meeting. More than that, unlike Aveline, who has to conform to what people expect of her, Kenway has the ability to pick whatever identity he wants to have. He literally steals an assassin's outfit and tries to pass himself off as one of their order, and successfully does so for several days. And he wasn't doing it to conform to social pressure, but because he thought he could make a cheap buck. And all three of these games, when taken together, sort of unintentionally form a really shallow but also kind of cool mechanical examination of race and gender relations and how they relate to social norms, just by walking around the city. They highlight the privilege of being a white dude by setting themselves in a time where white dudes didn't just have some privilege, but, like, all the privilege. And while they play roughly the same, I mean, they're all Assassin's Creed games, what with the stabbing and the shooting and the climbing, walking around town has its own tone and texture for each of them. Whether it's Kenway's freedom to choose whatever he wants to do at any time, Atawale's permanent and inescapable status as a runaway that causes him nothing but grief, or the constant pressure Aveline is under to dress and act appropriately. In all of them, we get to experience a small slice of life from these characters in the context of the society they lived in, and that's way more interesting to me than whether the Templars or the Assassins control the world. Unlike collecting freed slaves like their coins in Mario, these mechanics impart empathy. I guess there are a few things we can learn here. One, win states contextualize play, but they shouldn't be used in place of meaningful mechanical explorations of topics. Freedom Cry's advocacy of abolitionism by making freeing slaves a win state is about as deep as Bioshock's condemnation of objectivism by charging you to use the bathroom in a few levels. Second, symbol counters and point systems are a terrible way of dealing with mechanics that are supposed to engender empathy because they boil people down to a number or collectible. The only example I can think of where a simple statistic like this has worked is in DEF CON, and that's because the emotional distance you feel from seeing the text 1.5 megadeths on the screen and the carnage and sorrow that that number represents was sort of the whole point of the game. Finally, I think there's something a bit narcissistic about games, especially single-player games. It takes an immense amount of mechanical and narrative effort to make non-playable characters empathetic, and too often allies become objective markers and bad guys just become targets. We stop seeing the metaphor and we start just seeing the system. And you can overcome that tendency with enough mechanical and narrative prodding, look at Ellie from The Last of Us, but they definitely didn't do that much work with the slaves in Freedom Cry. 
So I think there's something to be said about the power of making players directly experience the differences between systems in order to make your point. Playing as Kenway, Aveline, and Atawale all together gives players a real mechanical exploration of a concept, but it's only by playing as all three and comparing and contrasting the way they each interact with their society that we can start seeing it. I guess my ultimate point is this. Building empathy for other characters in games, especially when they're intertwined with game mechanics and not very intertwined with the narrative, is excruciatingly hard. But making players build empathy for the characters they're actually playing is comparatively easy, and I'd like to think that that's a good thing because we really need fewer collect all the slaves to defeat slavery games and more subtle discussions of social pressures and prejudices.